Um, okay, so well, um, I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Um, so we're going to talk for the next few minutes about uh, some trends that are happening in reality capture. Um, and there's, there's certainly a lot of uh, trends that are going on because as uh, Pedro just said that he uses laser scanning, but there's an awful lot of laser scanning devices uh, and a lot of different workflows and technologies that are, uh, that are available into uh, the BIM market. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about those. Uh, those devices. So uh, again, who are we? As, as he said that, we're, that I am from Leica, but I'm more part of a larger organization called Hexagon. Hexagon is giant. Uh, it's a giant measurement company that specializes in a lot of different uh, measurement technologies, all of which can be used in BIM. Um, so one of the things that we want to be talking about is, uh, is is looking at the vision of how we want to apply a lot of these sensors into our workflows uh, and going into what uh, what is the end deliverable. So over the last two, two uh, presentations, I heard a lot about workflow. Workflow to get to the end product is key. Um, and that's a lot of the things that we want to, that I want to focus on. Um, so why am I here? Um, I could talk about probably for two hours on the history of Leica Geosystems and the, and the excellence that they bring into the market of how long ago that, uh, that they've been in the market. You know, we have, have over a thousand different patents on different technologies and measurements. Uh, but essentially what this slide says is that we kind of know a thing about thing or two about measurement. Um, and then me personally, um, I have a degree in civil engineering. I'm, I was a land surveyor in this lovely city of Boston for 11 years. Um, I have spent my fair share of time on 50-story skyscrapers doing a construction layout, you know, taking the models that you guys design and actually turning them into reality. Um, so I've had my fair share of, of uh, in the ditches and in the trenches. Um, and then I've also been uh, part of this reality capture phenomena for the past 19 years. Um, so I am one of the grandfathers in this industry, if you will. I got into it in the early 2000s, um, where I was in the surveying business. And of course, I've been with Leica for 15 years now. So uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that's going on. Um, and of course, one of the cool things is, and, and I've heard so many people talk about going to work every day. It's like, well, do you love your job? You know, do, do, you, do you actually consider your job as work? Or do you wake up every morning going, wow, this is so cool. And I want it, when it stops being that, I think that's when I might find something else to do. But this stuff is cool stuff. You know, you get to play with some fun toys. Um, you can see here, there's one of the devices that we have that is just a couple hundred dollars, but it can be used in the BIM, in BIM industry. And then we have some other devices that cost over, over half a million. So it depends on where you want to be, what kind of information that you want to collect. So what is BIM? So we talked about this last two presentation, talked about what is BIM. Of course, I looked up on the internet, internet's always right, of course. Um, but we talked about it's a more of a process of how you want to get from point A to point B. Um, and it's one of the challenges that I've always, uh, that I've had with even some of the people within my own company of describing what BIM is. And they're like, well, it's this tool and it's that tool. And then you put this into it. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's a process. It's every tool going into a central place where people can use it and share it. And that's, that's to me what BIM really, really is. Physical infrastructure. So BIM can be used from anywhere from Greenscape, from Greenscape all the way to Brownscape. Um, so, and of course, with a lot of the reality capture devices, those are more geared towards uh, a lot of the Brownscape pro projects. Or in other words, an existing building. So you have to you know, go and measure something and then apply a design to something building, uh, something that's existing. Of course, you can always use it for new stuff too, as, project, as you construct and then you want to uh, check your as-built to what's really being done. So there's all sorts of stuff there. So for the owners in the, bit, in, the, in the room, the good news is the construction is growing, right? So over the next few years, the, uh, when I was doing the research for this talk, we're talking somewhere around an 18% uh, compound annual growth in the construction business. Um, that's great news, right? So it means we're all gonna be in business for a while. The challenge what this slide does not show you is which industry is going to grow within construction because there's an awful lot of them. There's residential. There's commercial, there's, there's infrastructure. So what the slide doesn't tell you is that they're guessing probably in the next, in the next few years that residential and commercial is going to decline. But infrastructure is going to have to increase. So I have to start looking at some of the tools that are going to help you build your business to, to move you into the future proof. How many people remember Blockbuster? Right? Are they here? Are they still with us? Why? because they didn't evolve. 
They didn't change the way they did things. So you gotta make sure that you have enough tools and have those workflows in place that allows you to be elastic in doing your different type of workflows, right? So forward, I'm gonna talk about uh, a lot of, there's a lot of different tools and technologies uh, that we have uh, that, that are in the industry. So, and these are some of them that are up there. So what are some of the tools that we have? So we have terrestrial laser scanning. Um, and and our, our previous presentation talked about one of some of the terrestrial laser scannings. Um, there's all sorts of flavors and types, all of them which give you different accuracies. All of them, you know, I can talk to blue in the face about all those things. But then we have mobile devices. So mobile devices that can be mounted on cars. We have devices that fly. We have devices that are handheld that you move with. All of these devices create or produce a point cloud that has varied accuracy. Accuracy is important, especially when you start doing design. And then you start drawing that fine line between facility management or asset management and then design from that data, right? So if you don't wanna go and design something from, let's say a handheld device that's gonna get you data that's within plus or minus four or five centimeters. That's not design grade. You wanna design something that's gonna give you a point cloud that's super rich, super accurate. Right? So there's different, different technologies that you have to understand what they do uh, to get to your different end game. So this, uh, as I was going through this, uh, um, this presentation and doing, I did an awful lot of research on what we're doing. Um, and I found over and over and over again that there's five major trends that are happening in the BIM market now. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each one of those. First is 3D printing. All right, so we're gonna talk, uh, there is, that's a major trend that I keep finding. There's Internet of Things. Um, that is a trend that is now emerging that we all need to be aware of. Drone usage, that is happening more and more and more, that we're using more drones. And of course, some of, there's an awful lot of uh, restrictions and rules and regulations around using drones, but those are starting to be more and more relaxed. Um, and they're becoming a little easier to deploy. AR and VR, that's a big one. How do you visualize, maybe in 3D, do you actually have to put on goggles? Do you put it on a device? Is it just a screen? Is it on your phone? Is it whatever? How do you visualize what you have out in the field or getting out there? And of course, cloud collaboration. How do you share? Sharing this data about among us. And the last two presenters did a great job of collecting and creating these massive models. But how do you share it? How do you share it easy? Uh, and of course, as you heard Petro say, that he has one terabyte of scan data. Well, I've seen projects that are up to 50. So how do you share that? That's a lot of data to be shared, okay? So we're gonna talk about printing first. So printing is basically to help professionals create accurate elements associated with the building design in short with the, with the minimal loss of material. So essentially what that says, it's a lot cheaper to go print something on a plastic and say, hey, is this gonna work? Or are we gonna model something inside of Revit and do a rendering, and then you can do that. Uh, and then you can take a look at it. So we have a couple of customers that talk about, uh, that use this type of, of approach. Um, some of them uh, work for a, a rather large company called Disney. Um, and then they go in and they create these printed models of what they're going to build. And then the Imagineers can take this thing apart and they can do their stuff and say, well, I want that tree over here and that type of thing and, and move stuff around. So it's kind of a neat uh, thing to do that. But how do you get to 3D printing? So you have to provide the data to get there first. So yes, it's part of printing a model, but if you're in something that's already there, how do you get to a printed model of it? So that means you have to capture it somehow. You have to put it through some sort of program to create a mesh because you can't print a point cloud. I don't know of a program that actually will print a point cloud yet. You have to convert it to something. But the idea is, to provide actionable data right on the spot in a meeting. And of course, the name of the game in construction is minimize rework. Rework is expensive. I know general contractors love rework because that's called an RFI and they always charge a lot of money for them. They love that stuff. But as owners, we want to minimize that because we want the money, right? So that means we can invest, make other investments. So how do you get there? So there's all sorts of different things that we can do. We can capture. So it's whether you're going to use a tripod mounted system, whether you're going to be using driving, whether you're going to use handheld, really doesn't make a difference. Uh, but you have to capture the data somehow. And you have to combine it. So there's all sorts of different types of programs out there that you can combine data. Certain programs can handle 
maybe 50 scans. Some programs handle up to thousands. And then there's other programs that handle tens of thousands. And I've seen some pretty massive jobs over the years. Hey, let's dance. That was awesome. Um, so it depends on what kind of software, how many positions, how much 3D data you're going to capture that, you need to, uh, that we need to work with. And then we're going to convert it. So how are we going to get it from point A to point V? So converting it to a file format that is easily shareable, that can be moved between a lot of downstream programs and shared amongst the peers. That's important. Then you've got to refine it. Then you're going to convert that into your watertight meshes. And then you can do some other QA, QC pro, uh, processes against that data. And then, of course, then you can send it to the printer and visualize it. Next, Internet of Things. So this simplifies the process of data released to prefab workshop and contractors and modelers. So essentially, what does Internet of Things mean to you? Um, what it means to me is a lot of devices talking to each, talk to each other. Um, and sharing data between each other. The other thing is it's also moving interoperability towards interoperability. How do you create, all, have all these devices now talk to each other and can share the same data format? Also, it needs to me edge computing. So edge computing is now you're moving a lot of the processing out into the field. So gone are the days that when we would go out with the, with, into the field, collect a bunch of data, bring it back to the office, crunch a bunch of numbers, and then two weeks later we have an answer. They want it now. So how do you move that process out into the field? Uh, and then we have AI. So we're starting to have a lot of the programs with reality capture start to, uh, to develop and to push artificial intelligence. Imagine that, a computer learning off of a point cloud of what it can do and what it sees. And then there's some more deep learning uh, aspects. This is happening a lot uh, with a lot of the autonomous car industry. But I can also see it happening coming into the BIM and construction world as well. Of when you ca start capturing and you can teach a program, say, hey, that's a door, that's a window. And, and it automatically starts finding it. Um, so that's kind of exciting stuff. The other thing that we want to talk, that we always have is the challenge is a lot of reality captured devices, they all take pictures. So in certain companies, uh, countries, taking an image of a person is a big deal, meaning it's, you're starting to violate a lot of privacy laws. So how do you get rid of that stuff? So now you have to start thinking about data anonymization. How do you wipe away a person? So that's a challenge with some of these programs that are out there, and they're being developed. So, so one of the things that we got going on and so we have uh, this program that has a 95% certainty of actually taking, finding people and wiping them away. The thing that we did differently is instead of looking for people's faces, because you never can tell how a face is going to show up in a, in a reality capture scan, it's really you have it head on. Most from the side, from the back. And the other challenge is, is as you're driving along, and usually most of this data happens when you're driving, so mobile sensors is how do you differentiate between a person's face that's real or a billboard, right? Because people's faces are in billboards too. So what's the difference? So the challenge, what we did there is said, you know what? Instead of just doing the face, do the whole person. And the same thing with a car. So instead of getting a license plate, blur the whole car. And then you don't have to worry about it. So now you can start teaching the system, instead of looking for a face, look for a body and then look for a car, not a plate. And we can start to widen it, and then we can start to narrow down the way we teach some of these systems of how to go through it. Um, next thing is, is I want to show you this, this movie, hopefully it plays. Um, and this is a, an, an, uh, an example of edge computing. So essentially what you're looking at, one of the devices we have has five cameras in it. And when you pick this sensor up, it, the IMU inside of it knows it's moving, and then it turns on five cameras and watches where you go. And then from there, and you can see this is one of the hardest things to do, is you're going down from one position to another with no overlap. So it has to identify what's going on between from one setup to the next. And then on the tablet, it's going to automatically place that next position right where it belongs, so that now you can start making some of those decisions out in the field to say, okay, I know the distance between these two positions. It's not gonna be exact, but it's gonna be within a couple of centimeters. 
And that's good enough, I think, for a lot of times. Um, so that, that's very interesting. So having all those different things. And this, is, this technology is a derivative of what's called SLAM technology. So simultaneous location and mapping is what SLAM stands for. There's two types of SLAM. There's a visual camera-based system, which is similar to that. And there's also one that is LiDAR-based. So LiDAR is essentially the point, 3D point cloud. So as you actually move around with a handheld device or a backpack, it's actually using geometric figures from what it is sensing to place each position together and automatically combine where you're going. So at the end of the project, you just hit export. It's done. It's already put together. Okay? So that's, that's an example of some of the edge computing. So machine learning. So as I talked about that as going into machine learning, so how do we actually start to change the way that a point cloud is consumed? Um, me being around for the terrestrial side for an awful lot of years, typically we go out, we set this device up on a tripod, we do a scan, we do hundreds of scans. In some cases, we do thousands of scans. We've got to put these all together. Then you have a point cloud. Well, the challenge is, is we're getting time is becoming compressed. And as fast as scans can be done now, that we have some certain, certain devices can take a scan in 26 seconds. That's all you need, 26 seconds and bang, bang you, get a, you have a data. Thousands, hundreds of millions of points. The challenge is that that's not fast enough, especially as we start to expand our horizons and look at corridor mapping. So part of BIM can be actually five miles of, of roadway, go through a, city, through a city. So how do we actually map all that? That needs to be done quickly because there's an awful lot of people. So how many people have done a survey in their lifetime? Some. How many people have stood in front of the, front of the tripod and gonna take my picture? Yeah, get those guys out of here, right? So you have to do it at different hours so you can get the data correctly and get it quickly. Um, so what we got going on is now we can have some of this deep learning where we can start to teach the systems. This is a paint line. This is a, this is a Jersey barrier. This is a tree. This is a light pole. This is a utility pole of how do we actually move a, a thing from point A to point B. So one of the things in, in facility management, one of the things especially with uh, uh, plant and process, is they have these giant vessels that they have to move from manufacturer to position. And it has to go underneath bridges. So is it actually going to clear the way there? I can't even tell you how much, how many millions of dollars that is spent on just the first part of the design is that I'm gonna build this thing and it's giant and I need to transport it from point A to point B. And part of the process is understanding if it's gonna fit underneath that bridge. That's huge. Drones. So project managers in AC, are, you're starting to use drones for recording uh, and reporting and construction sites. So the idea behind drones is uh, a, lot of, a lot of the manufacturers that I've been going through is they all have devices. So we all have toys. Um, we all, and, and I have to say a lot of our toys are fun. Uh, the challenge is, is how do you create a system approach? So a lot of the drone stuff that is out there today is, well, you get a hardware of that guy, and then you get a software of that guy, and then you get a controller of that guy, and then you have to put it in this thing over here, and then you put it over there, and it's a hodgepodge of things. So how do you come up with a system approach? So obviously not everybody makes drones well. So the idea is to have a full software suite and system that pumps out a point cloud at the other side that is accurate enough for mapping. Because you know, we can go into drones, because anybody can go out and, and get a, a Phantom 4 and for a couple thousand dollars and fly. The challenge is, is when you convert that to a point cloud, the, the overlapping images may be only good for maybe half a meter. And a lot of times that's not good enough. So how do you do and get to the end purpose? And then, of course, you also have uh, all sorts of other devices that we can bolt on there. Or the other thing is you can also self-perform. Um, is that movie going to play? Nope, it's not going to play. Awesome. So, so you can even have people go out and do, um, and, and uh, you can sub out those, those contracts as well, and they can come out there and do it for you. So there's a lot of those things. AR and VR. Um, so we're examining th large 3D models become faster and better and easier. Um, so everybody, I think most manufacturers are all want to get into AR and VR. Uh, mine included, we all have, we have a, a, a viewer that you can use, but it's for models only. The challenge is with reality captures, we have these giant point clouds. How do we immerse ourselves into these point clouds and be able to view it 
without somebody putting on a, a pair of goggles and then getting a 3D mouse and going, oh my God, I'm feeling sick, because you're flying all over the place. You're in free space. So the challenge is, is teaching a system that this point cloud is actually a floor. Now jump to here or jump to there instead of just being in 3D space. And that's a challenge. Um, but we can certainly get there. There's other viewing capabilities. So imagine of going on to, into a site and seeing something like this. Um, I've been figuring this, this is actually a brewery. You've seen it three times now. I like beer. Um, so um, uh, viewing this type of system, uh, being able to see what's going on in there. So this is a quick movie that's going to play. But imagine having this type of view where you can go in there and just click in reality and just say, what's the distance between here? You know, I don't need it to be super accurate, but I just need to know, is something going to fit? Do I have enough room to put this or something in there? Having giant models as such. So the overall workflow is, is key to VR and, and, and AR. So again, it all, and, it has, and it's very similar to, uh, to printing. And, and I think the two of them go in hand in hand of, of, uh, of talking when they're, when they're uh, being taught together. So you have the reality capture, and then you have to prepare the data. And then you go into different viewing softwares. And then you have to model it. So you have to extract it. So uh, as I'm sure the, the last two speakers can, have, can attest to, that creating models takes a long time. It's still, there's no really good automatic staples, easy buttons here, push this out and outcome pops a model. That'd be sweet if we could. But there's too many uh, aspects inside of reality capture data that you just don't know what it is. They just need some human interaction. So then you have to share it. So how do we put all this point cloud data into other systems? Because not everybody uses the same software. Whether you're using AutoCAD, whether you're using Revit, whether you're using Navisworks. Uh, in other parts of the country, if they're using BricsCAD, if they're using some other software, you, know, you have to put it in there somehow, some way. Then visualize it. So now you want to start talking about how am I sharing this data to push it out into the field and share easily. And then collaborate. So now I'm going to have different types of collaboration tools. So now I have the same data that I can now push out into the field that I've been seeing in the field and vice versa, that now that we're starting to see capabilities of once the data is captured with a device, you can create a viewable web shared version and send that to the office in just a few minutes. Say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. What do we need to get? Or do we need to focus in a different area? So some of those things we need to take care of. And then of course, then you can convert it and put it into AR. So the other thing as I talked about is looking at different models and how you're gonna view the clash detection. So if imagine of having a model that you can physically move a model through a facility and see where it's gonna fit, where it's not gonna fit, or changes, and those types of things of moving it around. Um, and then you can also take just a quick snapshot of say, hey, you know what? This is going to be a really tight fit. I'm going to put this in there. What's my clearance? Now that's going to go back to the accuracy of your instrument, right? So you don't want to be collecting that type of data with something that's going to be good enough within three to five centimeters. You want it to be in the millimeter range, right? So that's different types of sensors that we can have there. One more. Um, the, the other next thing is the next group of professionals, one generation beyond us, they're all out of these guys or kids, um, they're all in the 3D visualization already. So we have to start adopting and looking into this VR visualization kind of seriously. How many here have kids, younger kids, right? How many of your kids play that game? Yeah, a lot of them, yeah. So, I, so I've, uh, I kind of caved. I started playing it with my kids myself, so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a fun game. But the thing is, is it's 3D. Even though that it's a very almost 8-bit block style, but it's fascinating to actually see how reality is now being converted into these child's games. So one of the things that, we, that my son, my oldest son, he's, uh, he's 16, he goes, hey, Dad, he goes, I have this world that I want to connect over to this island way over here, but I want to design this giant bridge, 
you know, thank God that Minecraft doesn't follow the rules of gravity. Uh, but I want to have this giant bridge that goes over to this other island. So he goes, well, okay, well, I think we can design something like that. And he goes, bah, but I need to know how much stone I got to mine. I got to do all this stuff. I got to figure out, you know, all this stuff. I said, okay, great. I said, you know what? I said, let's sit down because he's, he's a, uh, an aspiring engineer, which is interesting. He has the engineer's curse. It's funny to watch him build. He has to be very, has to be precise. has to be symmetrical. has to be exact. It's very funny. Um, <laughs> I said, hey, I said, well, let's sit down with the software that I have and let's design it. So we sat down and we designed this colossal structure together and we built it. So imagine now you're starting to use these visualization tools and these children are starting to come along. So it's a big thing for the next future vendor generations because construction is not going to stop. You know, there's always going to be some new buildings that need to happen to be built. So how do you actually adapt Again, remember, Blockbuster, you have to adapt. They didn't. Cloud collaboration this is the last bit that I'll talk about, and then we can do a little show and tell. Uh, using cloud frameworks, so BIM data can be addressed by anyone from any location. So as I talked about, is communicating out in the field. So workflows, uh, like, like I said yesterday, of yesterday, of going out, to collecting a bunch of data, going into the office, collecting, you know, doing a bunch of calculations, and then sending it back out, just isn't happening anymore. So now you have to place this data in the palm of somebody's hand, being able to go out there and look at what's going on, and then. You can also start to apply some of the reality capture sensors to facilities management, asset management, lifetime cycle management, because now you have tools at your fingertips that you have these giant models. And now you can say, you know what, what changed out there? I just talked to, we just talked about what the, cha the challenges of mapping what cha uh, changes. Well, now you can go out with a reality capture sensor, do a quick scan, bring it back into the model, and do what's called a, uh, an anti-clash which means that now I'm gonna check the point cloud against a model to see if something is either grotesquely out of place or doesn't exist, and it'll actually flag it, which is kind of interesting, okay? The other thing is having a data source that you can share amongst everyone, going into these different viewers that you can put into uh, the hands of, of many users all the same time. So having this data source, because as, uh, as we just heard, that we terabytes of data. So a single scan can be up to two gigabytes of data. One scan, that's two minutes of collection time, can be that big because of the pictures and the rich point cloud data. So how do you share that easily, getting it into a system that can be either consumed by a single person or can be on that enterprise level of sharing amongst different people? So again, and then actually, can you actually can, uh, have the model and the point cloud put together? Imagine a system that you can have a point cloud and then place a design inside of the point cloud where you can visualize what's going on uh, with, with design versus reality, because the point cloud's reality. Or how do you communicate to your customer's customer of creating an, a snapshot or putting some text or trading uh, uh, some sort of a, a, um, a measurement or something that's going on here? So you can see that here that I'm actually going through into some of our web tools and making markups right on the fly. So when somebody comes in there and looks at this later on, they can go into a certain snapshot and all these, these markups will be, um, will be visible, all right? Okay, so in summary, before I get to our show and tell, so again, the, the good news is construction's growing. The challenge is, is we have to adapt. We have to be able to be enough to have, a, be aligned with enough technology and in the trends of how you can adapt and move and sidestep from side to side to make sure that you're not gonna get caught in the blockbuster mess. Right? So trends, smart collaboration, uh, and of course, uh, um, with the, a shameful plug that like Geosystems in, in Hexagon, we're always here to help because we have all the tools that we can plug in there, all right? Um, so. I'm going to now do show and tell, which is kind of fun. How many people have seen a scanner work? Yeah. All right. How many people have seen the BLK work? That's good. I like that. Okay. So, scanning. Scanning is simple, simple, simple. Um, also, the nice thing is gone are the days that we need to have laptops hooked up to scanners, all sorts of stuff. So this little funny little fun little device to be okay. 
Uh, I'm going to operate it with a tablet software, and this is part of the edge computing software that I talked about, is moving some of these data, the decision making out in the field. So what I mean by that is now we're going to start to stitch some of this, this data together out in the field. So I can, oops, can I am? That's good. Sam, I am? So I can go into the data set and actually start remoting and using some of the data from a remote. So I'm going to go ahead and start a scan, which is kind of cool. So now what's going to happen is it's going to go ahead, do a scan, and it's going to send all the data into the tablet. So I'm going to do another scan real quick. I'm going to try if I can pull off two scans real quick, and I'll show you how easy it is to combine scans out in the field. So the idea is instead of having some poor guy or gal in the office try to figure out how to stitch together hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of scans, um, and I've done that, and I usually get really mad at people when they don't send me a sketch, um, so, but it is possible. But now you can do it out in the field. So with these types of applications, you can start to snap scans together. So when you bring it back to the office, it's essentially finished. All you have to do is do a little QAQC, and you have everything put together, which is kind of nice. So, and then if you have survey control or whatnot that you need to apply to it, uh, that's always the kicker, is always trying to match a, a drawing model with the point cloud, because usually the coordinate systems are different. It's fine. Yeah, it's a good time, right? All right. So now the scanner is going to go ahead and do the scan. So this device takes an image first. Uh, so it takes several images. It does uh, the imagery is what's called HDR imagery, so high, high dynamic range. So in this one, it takes three brackets. Uh, so it takes an overexposed, a regular exposed, an underexposed, combines them together for you. Um, and then it does all the tone mapping on board. Uh, we have, there's other devices out there that have five bracket HDR imagery. And of course, that's lots and lots and lots of data, but it happens pretty quick. Um, but the idea is it's still all part of uh, the reality capture workflow. Um, so, and then with some of these applications, you can go ahead while you're out in the field. So if there's something important um, that you can't quite scan because there's this thing called point spacing or resolution, um, that a laser is not going to get everything. So sometimes a picture or a side picture is what you want to do. Um, so what you can do is what's called geotagging out the field. So as you're collecting data, you can take the tablet, take a picture, and tag it into the data right where it belongs, which is kind of nice. Um, so right now it's uh, processing. So I have a scan. I can process it. I can go into 3D mode. Wow, so bright lights. Uh, but you can see all of us. So you're going to start doing in some of your um, measuring and so on and so forth. But you can have all of this data that's instant uh, at your fingertips. So what I'm going to do again is I'll just move. Go back to the map. I can do a second scan. So once this scan comes in, it'll come in, and then I'll be able to place them together and snap them together, which is kind of cool. Okay. Questions while we're waiting. Question is, how accurate is a scan? That's a great question. It depends on the device, um, because there's a lot of systems that have different, um, different aspects or different components in them. So for a terrestrial laser scanner, you have, uh, you have the laser aperture, which is the ranging error, and then you have the error of both the vertical and horizontal circle. Um, so in the BLK's case, it is accurate to plus or minus six millimeters at, at 20 meters. Okay? There's other devices that are out there that have much higher accuracy that are at plus or minus three millimeters out to 50 meters. So it depends on the actual the device. Now, if you're talking about a, something that's handheld using different types of LiDAR sensors, you're going to talk probably in the centimeter range, probably four to five centimeters, depends on where you are. Um, so then once you start moving, then you have time, trajectory, and then you have the difference between relative and, and absolute accuracy that you need to look at. So relative means within itself, and then absolute meaning that it is physically 10 feet from one side of the building to the other, um, and combining them together. So it's a good question. Yep. So 
So the question is, is this scanner useful for interior applications? That's what it was designed for, um, is meant for, because you can put this, you know, most ladies can put that in the pocketbook. Um, I mean, I carry it in, um, I put it in luggage all the time and carry it around. So um, there's all sorts of ways that you can carry it around. It is meant to be very portable uh, to do certain, those types of things. Now, there's all sorts of sensors. Now, can you use it outside? Absolutely, I've used it outside plenty of times, but it's also black, right? I live in Florida, it gets hot. Right? So the scanner is going to get really, really warm, so it's probably going to shut down at some point. Um, so there are other devices out there that are meant to be in those warm or extreme uh, temperature uh, environments. Um, so that's, that's a, one of the big challenges with a lot of reality capture devices is how well does it hold the calibration through temperature? Right? And that's a big deal, you know, because you want to be able to have a device that is, that is calibrated at minus 40 C all the way to plus 120 uh, C. So that's a big range, and it needs to be fired the same distance over that whole thing. So that's a great question. Okay. Okay, so I have a second scan here. See that I can, I can move it around. Oops, come on. So we can actually put this scan together. So I can say, well, this scan is kind of right here. It goes like this. Yep. So and then I can actually say, so you know what? I'm going to link these two. So hey, there's two my two scans, and I can move them around and, and say, you know what? These two belong right there. Say so optimize, click them together. Now I have a point cloud that is combined. So now I can go into my 3D and look at my two scans that are put together instantly out in the field. So edge computing are starting to push these things that are done typically in the office out into the field. So essentially it's like building a giant puzzle. 